nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Well, hello there, nature nuts Guess where we are today? We're in Ramsey Canyon, Arizona and why are we here? We're here for the same reason that almost everyone comes here, because this is one of the hummingbirdiest places in all of North America. Did you know that hummingbirds only live in North America and South America? There are no hummingbirds in Europe or Asia or Africa or Australia. That's a true fact. Everybody likes hummingbirds. You can't help but like hummingbirds. I mean, not only are they small, and they are really small. I mean, the smallest bird in the world is a hummingbird. It's the bee hummingbird from Cuba. It's a tiny little thing. And they're not very bird-like either, are they? I mean, they're kind of weird the way they hover in mid-air and they fly backwards and forwards and up and down. They sip nectar from flowers like some kind of insect. Some of them are beautifully colored. And they hum. Or at least, yeah, in my opinion, they don't really hum. It's more of a buzz. It's another one of those animal names that just drives me crazy. They should be called buzz birds, don't you think? It's like rattlesnakes don't rattle, they should be called buzz snakes. Buzzards don't buzz at all. That's why they're called vultures. A couple hundred years down the road, they'll finally get these animal names straightened out so they make sense. Anyway, I'm ready. Got my favorite binoculars, my favorite bird field guide. Let's go looking for some hummingbirds. Some people think hummingbirds migrate on the backs of geese, but this is just plain myth and baloney. Okay, now let's talk about hummingbird biodiversity. Biodiversity is a very popular theme these days. It has to do with appreciating the variety of living things around us. And I gotta tell you, I find most people are not at all prepared for just how diverse nature really is. So let's talk about the hummingbirds of North America, north of Mexico. There are quite a few species. I'll start with two widespread ones. In the east, the ruby-throated hummingbird, and in the west, the black-chinned hummingbird. They're very similar. Um, the males, I'm just gonna talk about the males here because the females are much more difficult to recognize. The males of the ruby-throated have a red throat patch. In the black-chinned hummingbird, it's a purple throat patch lovely little things, very familiar, and in fact in the east the ruby-throated is virtually the only hummingbird that most people see. Then there are two species that have not only a colorful throat patch but also a colorful crown on the head. In the desert the Costa's hummingbird has a purple color to that iridescent part, and the Anna's hummingbird, which is more widespread and goes way up the coast, that one is kind of pinkish red. Beautiful bird, beautiful. Most of these little guys around here right now are Anna's hummingbirds, although very few of them are adult males. Then the next group is the group that I think of as the mountain hummingbirds, the ones that have at least some rusty rufus in their feathers. In fact, there's one that has a whole lot of rufus. Rufus on the front, rufus on the back, red throat. That's called the rufus hummingbird. A few of them around here, pugnacious little guys. Then there's a little tiny one called the calliope hummingbird. Has a beautiful red throat fan with white flecks in it. Oof, gorgeous. And on the coast, there's one that looks like the rufus, but it has a, uh, has a green back instead of a rusty back. Then there's the broad-tailed hummingbird that makes a shrill whistling sound when it flies. Now the remaining species of hummingbirds, they have a markedly southern distribution. In Texas, you'll find the buff-bellied hummingbird along the Gulf Coast. That's a weird hummingbird. It's kind of green and brown, not much color to it. Nice one though. And then the Lucifer hummingbird in the Big Bend area, it's got a curved bill. The rest of them, 
This is the best place, southeastern Arizona. There are things like the broad-billed hummingbird with a red bill and a beautifully colorful body. And then two big hummingbirds, the magnificent hummingbird that has a green throat patch and the blue-throated hummingbird that has big white spots on its tail. And apart from those, the rest of them are all very rare. They occasionally cross the border. You don't see them all the time. They're not that reliable. I'll only mention one, and that's the white-eared hummingbird because it's been hanging around these very feeders. We've been seeing it in the last little while. Beautiful thing with a white ear stripe and vibrant colors. Man, hummingbird biodiversity, you just gotta love it. Everyone wants to attract hummingbirds to their own yard, and it's a lot easier than you might think to get them to come to your place. You can either plant hummingbird flowers, or you can set out hummingbird feeders. Let's talk about hummingbird flowers first, because, you know, they remind you of why hummingbirds are the way they are in the first place. Hummingbirds have evolved alongside a whole suite of flowers, and these flowers generally have the following characteristics. They have long tubular blossoms, and they're either red or pink or purple, somewhere in that color range. And of course, you know, the hummingbird comes to one of these flowers, sticks its long bill in the long trumpet of the flower, and uh, receives nectar. There's nectar at the base of that trumpet. And then in return, of course, the hummingbird's face gets dusted with pollen, and when it visits the next flower, it pollinates the flower just the way a bee or a butterfly would. And so that's why there are hummingbirds and hummingbird flowers. But the other thing to remember is don't just plant one little plant and expect the hummers to make a special trip. Plant a whole mess of them. Make it worth their while, and that way you'll get a good uh, number of hummingbirds visiting your feeder. Now, on the other hand, hummingbird feeders are a very easy, simple way to get hummingbirds to your yard. There are a zillion different designs of hummingbird feeders. What really matters is what you put in them. Now, I've got a feeder here. This is a nice small one. It's got all the basic uh, features of a hummingbird feeder. There's always some part of the feeder that's going to be red, and that red part attracts the hummingbird the same way a red hummingbird flower would. You don't have to put any coloring in the solution that you feed to the hummingbirds. In fact, it's a good idea not to do that because uh, it may very well be that the color dyes are harmful to hummingbirds. No one knows, so why take a chance? Okay, here's how you do it. You simply use granulated sugar, white sugar. Don't use honey, and especially, well, honey, by the way, can sometimes give uh, hummingbirds illnesses. And especially don't use diet sweeteners because they have absolutely no nutritional value. That's why they were invented. I filled it about a quarter full of sugar and then I'll just fill the rest up with water. Tap water, regular old everyday water. And that gives you a solution that is about the same concentration as the nectar in wild hummingbird flowers. If you give them a more concentrated, a stronger solution, they will use it, but they'll do just fine on a four to one sugar water mixture. And if you have a lot of hummingbirds at your place, you may find that you're going through a heck of a lot of sugar. So four to one's a good, uh, good rule. I'm just uh, mixing it here, covering the little hole so I don't get sticky sugar water all over my feet. Make sure to clean your feeder out at least a couple of times a week, especially if little bugs get in there and drown in the, in the solution. This is a, uh, a bee guard. It's intended to keep those bees and ants and things out of the feeder. And all you have to do now is just hang it up in a, an appropriate spot. If it's a good spot, there should be a hummer there in a couple of minutes. If it's a bad spot, it could take a couple of years. Let's go see what happens. Most 
most hummingbirds beat their wings about 50 times per second. Well, isn't that the coolest thing? This garden fountain is attracting hummingbirds, and some of them are coming in just the way any old bird would to a bird bath, and they're splashing around and having a little bath. They look kind of goofy when their feathers get wet. They're so tiny, and their feathers stick up funny. It's very important for birds to have baths, so I, you know, keeps them clean, gets the bugs out of their feathers. But some of them are also coming and hovering right at the top of the spray and catching water droplets in midair. It's the most beautiful thing. They look at the water droplets, they decide which one to try to catch, and then they catch it. They must be getting a drink of water. You'd think after all that sugar water, you'd want a drink of just plain old everyday fresh water. Your mouth must get really sticky. That is very neat. I've never seen that before. Have you ever seen it? Does it happen in your garden? If it does, drop me a line. I'd like to hear about it. And if you think hummingbirds are cool, have a look at that. That's a hummingbird nest, and that is about the cutest little bird nest you're ever going to see in your life. It's right there. This is a very typical hummingbird nest. It's made of spiderweb and lichen. The lichens are probably plucked off those rocks over there, the ones with the yarrow's spiny lizards on them. And the, the cavity for the eggs, the little bowl, it's only about the size of the end of your finger. The eggs themselves are about half the size of a jelly bean. Magnificent. And you should see the mother hummingbird feeding the young. I've got some home video of it. It looks like she's going to impale them. She sticks her bill right down their throat to give them the food. Unbelievable. Very, very neat indeed. Hummingbirds breathe about 250 times a minute and their hearts beat at a rate of about 1,300 beats per minute. We think of hummingbirds as colorful birds, but have a close look at them. All of them have a shiny green back, at least almost all of them, but on most of our North American hummingbirds, the only really colorful part is the throat of the male. And that part, that patch of feathers is called the gorget. It's a wonderful little thing because, uh, because it's so brightly colored. The feathers are iridescent. And iridescent colors in birds, they're very interesting in their own right. It's like this feather here. This is, of course, not from a hummingbird. It's a feather from the wing of a mallard duck. And you'll notice that at some angles, you get a beautiful bright blue patch on that feather. At other angles, it just looks gray or brown. That's because there are two sorts of things that are going on to produce the color on this feather. First of all, there are pigments, colored chemicals in the feather. And when you look at the light that's going through the feather, you're just seeing the light transmitted through the pigments. That's the gray and the brown color. And then you have the iridescence. And the iridescence is a property of the light reflecting off the feather. Here where there's no iridescence, it's just reflecting off the pigments. Here where there is iridescence, it's reflecting, the light is reflecting off millions and millions of very tiny ridges or layers in the feather, depending on the sort of iridescence that's involved. And those ridges are spaced at the same distance as the wavelength of the blue light that we're seeing. It's a very interesting little bit of physics that we don't have to get into any detail on here, but that's the point. It's a physical property of the feather and not a chemical property of the feather. And what that means is that the bird can turn that color on and off depending on how it holds the feathers. So the gorget of the males, the function of the gorget is as a signal. And it's either a signal they use in courtship to the females or as an aggressive display to other hummingbirds, either to get males out of their territory or sometimes you'll see it at the feeder. They'll spread the gorget and look straight at another hummingbird and you get this bright pop of color, which to us is very beautiful, but to another hummingbird, it's either very sexy or very scary. 
that's the function of the gorgets. Now you'd think that a hummingbird couldn't manage without a gorget, but the fact is, although most of our North American hummingbirds do have the gorget patch, if you go further south into Central and South America, the hummingbirds are just as colorful, but not all of them have the gorget. We had our camera down in Trinidad not long ago, lots and lots of hummingbirds, fantastic critters, but not all of them have the gorget patch. At night, a hummingbird's heart and breathing rate slow down, their temperature drops, and they go into a state of torpor. Hummingbirds are so cute looking, they're so sweet looking, but as soon as you start watching them, you have to notice that they don't really get along very well with one another. They're always sparring over who gets to sip at which feeder and stuff like that. Oh man, the rufous hummingbirds, they're a especially obnoxious little guys. Uh, they're almost violent. Spread their tails, rush at each other with their little sharp bills, point dog fights in the sky. If I was a hummingbird, I don't know, it wouldn't be a peaceful life. You'd need to have the reflexes of a fighter pilot and nerves of steel. Fiery colors and listen to the hum. Hum, hum and boo. They're real hum dingers, but they're not hum drum. Hummingbirds are little, their hearts beat really fast. They go a mile a minute to the future from the past. Once I saw a hummer a sipping at a fleur. Another hummer buzzed in. They tangled in a whir. Hum, 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 hummingbirds. See the fiery colors and listen to the hum. hum. Hummingbirds They're real humdingers But they're not humdrum Hummingbirds like sugar Or anything that's red Put on your old ball cap Don't hum you in the head Little tiny hummers They're smaller than a bug To think they came from dinosaurs It makes some people shrug
Boy, these hummers are really tough to spot up in the trees, aren't they? I mean, they're just so small. They live in a world where other birds are giant creatures and most of the things that are the same size as them are bugs. It's very interesting to think about that. I mean, hummingbirds are so small that it's not unheard of for a big praying mantis to catch one at a flower and kill it and eat it. Not that I've ever seen that and not that I'd want to show it to you, but it does happen. Hummingbirds have all sorts of weird interactions with insects and spiders and mites. Ooh, mites. You've got to hear this story about hummingbirds and mites. There's a kind of mite that lives in hummingbird flowers. When the mite wants to go to a new flower, it waits for a hummingbird. The hummingbird puts its bill in the flower. The mite runs up the bill and jumps in the hummingbird's nostrils. And you get all these mites in the hummingbird's nostrils. And then when it comes to the next flower, they jump out and run down the bill and they get to a new flower. Ooh, I wouldn't tolerate that if I was a hummingbird, but what do you do? Sneeze, I guess. Anyway, what else can I tell you about hummingbirds and insects? Well, there is one kind of a moth that looks so much like a hummingbird that people call it the hummingbird moth. And the moth is often mistaken for a hummingbird, just the same way that hummingbirds are often mistaken for moths. And then there's bees and wasps. When hummingbirds come to a feeder, and there are bees and wasps there, they, they pretty well have to let the bees and the wasps have their turn first because uh, even the most obnoxious hummingbird isn't gonna start a battle with one of those critters. I can imagine a bee sting would be a pretty bad thing to, uh, to happen to a hummingbird with a little tiny body like that. But to get back at them, hummingbirds do eat the occasional little bugs. They mostly take in nectar, but they will grab little bugs, little spiders, and supplement their diet, get all their proteins and vitamins and trace elements that way. The smallest hummer is the bee hummingbird, which is only 57 millimeters long and lives in Cuba. Well, I guess that's about all the hummingbirds we have time for. I hope you've enjoyed our little hummingbird expedition. I've enjoyed it, and I get such a kick out of the fact, you know, every time we tell people down here that we're making a hummingbird show, they're so apologetic because the migration has begun and so many hummingbirds have gone south. There are hardly any left, apparently. So you can imagine what this place must be like in the prime season. So I hope you get out, enjoy some hummingbirds, either coming to one of these hot spots or seeing them in your own yard. So until next time, I'm a nature nut and a hummingbird nut, and I hope you are too. Bye for now. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.